The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Ongoing controversy surrounding allegations of some of Obama's personal identification documents and records, including his selective service draft registration form, are forgeries, came into sharp focus several months ago when the cold case posse under the leadership of Sheriff Joe Arpaio opened an inquiry in response to those allegations. Well, what happened shortly thereafter is the next story that we're going to tell you. This is a piece that appeared in the Washington Times, a section of the Washington Times called Community at the Washington Times. The question of President Obama's draft card, has evidence been destroyed? And joining us this evening to talk about it are Alan Jones, who is an investigative reporter. He writes a column called Freedom of the Press is Not Free at the Communities at the Washington Times. And uh, also Lisa Ruth, who was a CIA officer and analyst for 11 years, now a managing partner at C2 Research, a boutique research and private intelligence firm in West Palm Beach, Florida. She's also a senior analyst with Lignet.com of Newsmax Media and an editor and writer for the communities at the Washington Times. Both of them, we want to welcome them to the program. Lisa, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. And Alan, nice to have you as well. Welcome. Thank you, Andrea. All right. Tell us about this story here. The question of President Obama's draft card. Has evidence been destroyed? What is the deal with this? And, I'll, and I guess, uh, Alan, I'll let you and Lisa de defer to one another. I'm opening the question to either of you. Okay, uh, Andrea, first of all, I just wanted to tell your listeners a little bit about what community is at WashingtonTimes.com is and what it's all about, because it's really something unique, I think, in the media landscape. Uh, communities at WashingtonTimes.com is a new digital media product of the Washington Times, which is the parent, uh, that brings valid social journalists together to write compelling content in a wholly supported group. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm new to communities at Washington Times. I've been talking uh, with Jackie Kubin, who is um, the editor in charge of the communities, and um, she's been encouraging me for um, about four months in my research looking into uh, Barack Obama's background, and in particular his social, uh, excuse me, his selective service uh, card. <laughs> I was working on an investigative piece. As part of the process, I've been following what uh, the cold case posse in Arizona is doing. I was aware that in March they had sent two uh, letters to the uh, director, uh, Lawrence Romo. He's the director of the Selective Service uh, System, and they, he was requesting uh, access to the original records for Barack Obama's 1980 draft registration. I will say his alleged 1980 draft registration. And I hadn't heard anything, so I called up my editor and said, would it be all right if I reached out to the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and request an interview and or an update? And she said, sure. So I reached out and heard back uh, several days later from uh, Michael Zulo who is the lead investigator of the cold case posse. And he told me in his words that his agency was being stonewalled by officials at Selective Service System. After I heard that, I decided to see what sort of uh, legal basis um, that agency might have to um, drag their heels or if there was anything I didn't know about the process. I, started digging through the regulations that um, like the service system operates under, and I discovered that there had recently been issued a uh, document called Privacy Act of 1974 System of Records. And uh, to my surprise, I found that it had been uh, published in the Federal Register, which uh, maybe your readers probably don't read it every day. It's a little bit dry, but it's a journal of uh, basically daily agency activities and directives that they issue five days a week. And in it was uh, this new update of the privacy regulations for select service. And what's surprising was the date on it. It was September 20th, uh, 2011, so that was just a few months ago. And I said, 
That's interesting because that's kind of around the same time Sheriff Joe announced that he was doing this investigation. Mm -hmm. So I put the dates side by side, and what do you know? It was four days after. Jerome Corsi on Friday afternoon, the, uh, I believe it was the 16th, Friday afternoon, 16th of September, he announced on World Net Daily uh, the cold case posse has uh, started an inquiry into Barack Obama's um, documents after there were allegations of forgery put forth by the uh, surprise Arizona Tea Party. And then I look and see that the following Tuesday that the Selective Service System quietly issued these new regulations and I then thought, well, maybe they just do this every year. Maybe this is just business as usual. So I ran through uh, the federal record to see when was the last time they had updated these, and it was uh, 11 years ago, back in 2000. Wow. Wow. What, I mean, what are the chances, what are the odds that these, that these records would be uh, changed <laughs> right after the investigation is uh, – they're asking for information on it. Ha. Huh. So what did you do at that point? Well, first of all, I didn't sleep for two weeks. And around the clock, research this to try to get a handle on what it is that we're dealing with here. Is this something or is this just a coincidence that doesn't mean anything? So first thing I did was, you know, I ran this by my editor, Jackie Kubin, and asked her, what do you think? She said, this is interesting. We may have something here, but I want to get you in touch with Lisa Ruth, who uh, has been working with the communities for a while, and with her background with the CIA, you know, she probably, you know, would be a fresh set of eyes and let her take a look at it. So uh, I'm going to turn you over to Lisa and let her explain uh, uh, what she thought about this. All right. Oh, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, and I guess my starting point was let's see the research. As you all know, there's a lot of smoke out there and a lot of allegations flying around, but I wanted to see really strong research. And what Alan presented us was step-by-step, -step, very detailed information. As you said, wow, look at the dates. I mean, you, you can't change the dates. And because I had worked in the government, I asked him some questions. I said, okay, but what does this mean? Where was it published? Are we making too much out of this? And Alan came back with more strong research. I'm telling you, he read this, as he said, dry publication that the rest of us fall asleep on, but he studied it and compared it and contrasted it. And we threw questions at him and said, are you sure? And what about this? And he kept coming back with real strong research. You can't deny the research. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, it, it stands up. It's accurate. What does it mean? You know, I'm going to get back to Alan for all that. But the, the research is real strong. It's out there, but it takes a lot of time to develop and, and pull it up. And our whole goal was to make sure that it was airtight, and that's what Alan did. So, Alan, uh, what, did, what did you, okay, and at that point, what did you do? Well, I had to take basically a crash course in federal records, which I admit I don't know much about, but didn't know much about. And the agency that is in charge of federal records, everything having to do with federal records, is called NARA. That's the National Archives and Records Administration. Now, before, a few weeks ago, I figured, oh, yeah, the archive guys, yeah, they're the ones who are make sure that the humidity and temperature at the uh, museum where they store the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are accurate, you know, and they've got a security guard guarding it, and that's about all I knew about them. I didn't realize that just about every uh, regulation that um, agencies within the government, whether it's the Department of Energy or the EPA or, um, in this case, the Selective Service system have to operate under, um, there are very specific rules about how they handle federal records. Now, what is a federal record? Excuse me. It's just about any kind of uh, information capsule that you can imagine in any number of forms. Obviously, you know, 150 years ago it was all paper. Now we've got digital files, computer records. We've got photographs that are taken from outer space by uh, NASA. We have um, um, 
videotapes that are taken in combat zones overseas. We have um, forms that you fill out when you apply for Social Security. Anything that is a document that the government uses to record business that they conduct is considered property of the United States, it's considered a federal record, and it's very strictly regulated how it's handled, where it's stored, um, and you can't simply throw these out or dispose of them without going through all kinds of regulations and red tape. Okay, so what you discovered was that the government was um, going to destroy microfilm copies of the Selective Service registration records under new rules. <laughs> right. These, uh, these um, regulations, this Privacy Act of 1974, systems of records, it's pretty dry reading. But we've posted on the uh, website the PDFs from 2000 and also the new one in 2011 that was issued four days after the cold case posse started this investigation. And you can actually go through it. What I did was I went line by line through the uh, regulations until I got to the section that dictates how um, the draft registration cards, the records of those registrations are um, managed. Now, it's all mostly changed in 1980. Just to give your listeners a little background, you know, we, we came out of the Vietnam War um, in uh, the mid-70s, and there had been actually a draft, as we all know. Um, the uh, general mood of the country was very torn apart, and so the draft was not a popular idea. Uh, the President Ford actually dissolved the um, draft registration requirement and went into what's called deep standby. Then in December of uh, 1979, uh, the uh, Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. That was under Jimmy Carter. That was, a, once again, a Cold War wake-up call. You know, there's something going on. We need to be ready just in case. So Carter signed Proclamation 4771, which reactivated Selective Service requirement. At this point, Barack Obama had been uh, out of college for, uh, excuse me, out of high school for about a year. So the draft registration was once again required. Now, they have to keep these records. The young men, you know, when they turn 18, they have to fill a card out. They bring it to the post office, drop it in the mail. That card then goes to a processing center. What I've learned is the way this works is that at the processing center, they would take the, pra the paper card and then take a photograph on it onto microfilm. Those original microfilms of these cards are supposedly, and they're supposed to be, based on, on the procedures that Selective like Service System operates under, they're supposed to be an original microfilm at a federal records center somewhere, and that would be operated by NARA. Now, what Selective Service System has is copies of those original microfilms, which are also on microfilm. In fact, they're supposed to have two copies. Okay. Um, so they would have the original microfilm stored at a federal record center under NARA. Then the Selective Service System would have two more microfilms in their custody, and those are stored at a data, at a data management center in Illinois near Chicago. And then finally, now that we're in the computer age, they've also transferred the microfilm into computer records that are stored on their computer networks. Now, what's going through these rules line by line, what I discovered was that there was a change in the wording of the description uh, of the copies of the microfilm records that are also on microfilms. The original term in 2000 was microfilm copies. Those two words were changed four days after Arpaio and the cold case posse started the investigation from microfilm copies to microfilm non-record copies. Hmm. A bit of a technicality here, huh? Well, that's where, uh, that's where, and, and Lisa really encouraged me to really figure out what does this mean. And what I determined was that there's a federal record is a very specific 
type of thing that covers, it, it actually covers just about every kind of document imaginable, like I told you, that the government has. Very few things that the government has are actually non-records. Examples of those would be personal things that you maybe use at work, maybe you jotted something down on a piece of paper, something that's not important. But records are things that are stored in filing systems, they're locked in secure facilities, um, they're important in day-to-day -day government uh, business. They've laid out a whole bunch of criteria of what a federal record is. And what Lisa and I had to determine was we knew that microfilm non-record meant non-record. And non-record means that it's not important and you can throw it out. What we had to determine was whether microfilm copy, which is what it said in 2000, if that meant that it was a federal record. And everything that we could see based on, on this, uh, NARA has a 168-page handbook called Disposition of Federal Records, a Records Management Handbook. They have all the criteria to determine what a federal record is. And everything that we could see was telling us that this microfilm copies of these draft registration cards are indeed by default federal records. These are important. I would even say that these are important for national security. Let's just say, God forbid, something happened to the computer systems. You know, maybe some kind of cyber attack or something. Just imagine, you know, with a war situation, possibly, you know, the selective service records on the computers could be possibly um, compromised. Well, now you've got these microfilms at least as a backup. But so how could you suddenly just say, well, these are non-records and we can just toss them out? That seems to me like there's something wrong with that picture. And, no, and the only right. thing, I'm, no, I'm sorry, Lisa. Just, just oh. one cl clarification. The, the non-record designation, as Alan said, and, and just because we want to make sure this is very, very clear, non-records doesn't mean they are throwing it away. It means they could throw it away. And what we're looking at is an opening. Is this a door that, that creates a crack to destroying records? We don't know that they have destroyed records. However, designating something as a non-record copy does open that possibility. You know, what this reminds me of is um, the missing uh, passport records. The, the State Department says that they destroyed them of Stanley Ann Dunham, his, uh, Obama's mother. <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, they just, they're just gone. <laughs> it's like, what? You, you got rid of them? Really? I didn't know you could do that, that kind of thing. One other question that's coming from uh, one of the uh, listeners who is uh, very familiar with uh, how Washington operates. Um, she's asking the question, first of all, was the new regulation published for a comment period like all others need to be, or was it fast-tracked? Good question, very good question. I did find that early in 2011 that there had been a very brief mention in the federal record that the entire set of regulations that Selective Service operates under, the entire uh, act in the Code of Federal Regulations was being reviewed. It didn't specify which section of it. it. didn't say that they were looking at the privacy rules. It just said in general, we're looking at them and we may occasionally from time to time change something. Now, this was a Friday afternoon that the cold case posse made this announcement. And then on, by Tuesday, it was in the federal record. So I checked with the uh, NARA, which actually coincidentally also runs the federal record, and just to see how long the uh, notification needs to be that you're going to publish something. It's actually only uh, about three business days. You can actually get something in there even faster in an emergency situation if you have um, a letter accompanying your request explaining what the situation is. Um, now, sometimes an agency will publish something in the federal record and they'll just announce that this is a proposal and we're uh, opening a comment period on so-and-so after we cut comments and we'll issue new rules. But this was not a comment period. This was just seemed to be a pretty much boom, you know, new rules. Mm. She also added that if the change of the wording actually changed the way the agency does business, the new regulation needs to be posted for public comment for a certain period of time 
this is what I think they bypassed as something to check out. So there you have it. That's um, a good point. That's a good, very good point. Yeah, yeah. Also, um, you're saying in this uh, article that if microfilm copies of selected service records are destroyed, it would make it difficult to prove whether or when Obama registered with the selective service, and that at issue is whether he attended Occidental College in Los Angeles as a foreign student, possibly using an Indonesian passport. Now, foreign students, they're not required to register with selective service, correct? Yeah, from what we could see, that appears to be the case, which is interesting because, um, in general, um, people are not U.S. citizens that are here, even whether they're here illegally, um, do you have to uh, register for selective service. But there are some exemptions. One of them are um, diplomats and their families. Um, and another appears to be, we're trying to verify that, because these rules do, do change from time to time, and we want to make sure, you know, the, we're dealing with 1980. This wasn't yesterday. But it, it appears that um, foreign students are exempted from what we can tell right now, but I do reserve, you know, the opportunity to change that if I learn otherwise. Okay. Now, you say that also that there was a paper copy of Obama's Selective Service Registration Card, uh, a form called the SSS-1. Uh, that it was obtained days before the 2008 election through a FOIA request by a retired Immigration and Customs Enforcement agent. Um, what's the deal with this person, the Stephen Kaufman, this former ICE agent? Um, why was he requesting this, and what did you find out about it? Um, I haven't spoken with Mr. Kaufman. I have tried to reach out to him, but uh, we did actually uh, – contact ICE, which is uh, part of the Department of Homeland Security, and they did uh, go on the record to, to tell us that, yes, Mr. Kaufman uh, was with the agency, and uh, he did retire in 2007. So we know that we know a little bit about him and that he was uh, with ICE, and uh, this uh, FOIA request apparently, according to um, what we've read, uh, I was posted on a website of someone named uh, Debbie Schlussel. And uh, she claims on her website that Mr. Kaufman spent the better part of the year trying to uh, actually get this and that it was uh, sent out from Selective Service System headquarters in uh, Arlington, Virginia, only six days uh, before the election. So by the time it got to him through the mail, we were talking, you know, maybe two days before the election. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Um, and this uh, this particular card or the copy, uh, well, it was a, it was a copy of the card. I would imagine. Um, what, was this determined to be fraudulent by him? Do you know? Well, um, their initial reaction apparently on Schlusel's website was that there were some uh, things that looked odd about it, but. You know, that was just an initial reaction, but they did analyze, for example, the, the number on it and the date stamp stood out as um, looking unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. Since that time, the cold case posse has gone more in-depth with it, and they came out and announced on March 1st at their press conference that they believe that the document was fraudulently created and that the date stamp is fraudulent to give the impression that the card was accepted by the Postal Service in uh, – July 29th of 1980. At a Honolulu, Hawaii post office, right? Claiming right. that Obama so registered there and then. The Makiki Station post office, which is located only about a mile and a half um, from uh, the apartment where uh, Obama lived when he was in high school. All right, this was 1980. So does that square, let's see, he was born in what, 61? No, right. Wait, uh, well, we, this is, we're, we're basing all this information on a document which is alleged to be fraudulent by the cold case posse, which is his long-form uh, Hawaii certificate of uh, live birth. So based on that, that, that date is August 4th, 1961. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what you're saying then is that um, uh, even if the microfilm copy 
and the Selective Service System Data Management Center in Illinois has been destroyed, that the original microfilm has to be being held at one of the federal record centers, which is, as you said earlier, a long-term record facility operated by uh, NARA. Uh, is it there? Have you checked it? Well, why don't you ask uh, Lisos, but we actually both were trying to get in a hold of NARA to find out. We were under uh, time pressure, you know, because we wanted to bring this story out. But Lisa, why don't you tell her about your experience first trying to find out something? Uh, well, it will be fairly short. Basically, you know, as someone who worked in the government, I, I can attest that this should never happen. But I was on hold for more than an hour with, with no answer. So I have to say that we didn't get any information. It, it's perplexing to me that, you know, it's sad that our government has, has put you on hold for an hour, but I can't say there was anything conclusive about that. You know, I just don't know. We, we, we did not get a statement on that from them, or at least I didn't. Alan, I, did you? She, yeah, I did get a statement, but um, this is, you know, just one statement, and, and we're still trying to learn more about exactly um, what the relationship is um, between NARA and Selective Service System as far as handling of original microfilm uh, uh, records is. I talked to someone at the, there's a very large facility in St. Louis called the National, I believe it's called the National Personnel Records Center, which is a federal record center that uh, maintains a lot of uh, um, personnel records for the military. They also archive Selective Service records for men born until January 1st, 1980. Now, Obama was allegedly born um, about a year and a half after that. So the question was, you know, where are these original microfilm records that Selective Service System says in their privacy rules are in the custody of NARA. And I talked to someone um, named Brittany H. in the Customer Service Department at the National Personnel Records Center. And she, I asked her, well, if I'm looking for a selected service record for someone born in, after 1960, where, what, where should I go? She directed me to go to Selected Service System. And then I said, well, are there any records of registrations that are for men born after 1960 that are in long-term storage with NARA. And her answer was, um, the Selective Service records for men born after 1960, which Obama was, are not archived with NARA and are not in long-term storage with NARA. Now, remember, this is just one person in a customer service department who she may or may not have the big picture, you know. So I'm not going to hold an entire agency up to one statement, but that's all we know so far. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also a bit confusing, you know, again, it's unclear at what point the custody of the records should transfer from the Selective Service to NARA and whether when they are transferred the original will be retained or whether the original can be destroyed. A lot of that stuff, it's just not spelled out. It's very, very unclear, it's very nebulous, and it's very difficult to get answers. Mm -hmm. I got an email from uh, William Lawley uh, sent to us through JetDriver, who is one of our listeners here. Uh, it was an FYI to me. And uh, Bill Lawley asked, he says, a fellow birther asked the following two questions after the breaking of the Washington Times community story. Uh, and then he said, below are the questions and the answers I believe to be the most accurate. And I believe that he received his sources included Wikipedia, Federal Register, uh, Wikipedia Code of Federal Regulations, Cass Sunstein, uh, Library Direct Orders, this is a govinfo.library, and uh, Wikipedia, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. I want to share with you what he wrote. Uh, he says, uh, below are the questions and the answers I believe to be the most accurate. Number one, what was the A, the specific reason given, and B, what specific wording was used, and C, by whom was the action initiated in making such a change to selective service record keeping? Here, here's the answers. The answer to A, 
um, no specific reason is required. The Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has complete authority to interpret, rewrite, and implement all federal regulations. A PDF is attached of the new regulation via the FR. Okay, second one. The original documentation used to initiate the changes are unavailable to the general public. The administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has full control in the creation, augmentation, and placement of federal regulatory changes in the Code of Federal Regulations. All CFRs have the statutory effect of administrative law. It is law by fiat. And then the third question, you know, who, who initiated it, is unknown. But the approving authority is the administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. And guess who that is? Cass Sunstein who has been called by Glenn Beck the most dangerous man in America, Mr. Uh, regulation, Communist Regulation. Second question, what legal process is required to initiate such an amendment? First, a directive from the administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, Cass Sunstein. Authority comes from the June 1994 Executive Order 12866, the OMB, and the 1980 Paperwork Reduction Act, and Above Cass Sunstein, the pre above Cass Sunstein, the president is the final authority. So this, according to Bill Lawley, who, well, like I said, did the research over there, um, he he's thinking that uh, this this is coming right out of Cass Sunstein, right out of the White House. What do you think of that? Um, we <laughs> are we are uh, following up on trying to. See what the who would I need, who would need to sign off on this? Um, um, at this point, this is being researched, and um, we're following up on this. So I'm not going to comment a lot on that, but we're looking uh, very closely at um, the chain of command that might be involved in something like this. But it's mm -hmm. um, it's being looked at. And I'll even give a little bit of a tease to watch for Alan's next one. He has absolutely uncovered some interesting ties and some interesting uh, uh, people to look at. So there will be a part two. Oh, we're looking forward to that. How soon will that be before we can see that, Alan? Uh, working to get it uh, out as soon as we can. But um, uh, based, you know, as you see, you know, the folks that I work with, like uh, Lisa, have very high standards, and will hold me to those, and will ask me the hard questions. So. Um, I'm gonna, you know, find out everything I can, and then, um, and then try to have them assess what it is that we may have discovered. All right, all right. Well, we'll be watching for it. You'll let us know when it appears over there at communities at WashingtonTimes.com. Alan Jones and Lisa Ruth, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for the good work that you're doing. To the, the work that the mainstream media will not do It's just incredible. This is the stuff that we depend on our press. To do as neat as, as the government watchdogs, they do not do it, and it's up to citizen journalists like yourself to do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing, Alan and Lisa. Much appreciate your time tonight. Great, thank, thank you, you for your time as well. The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide.